Hello and welcome to Car Dealer Live. I'm James Baggett, founder of Car Dealer Magazine, and today on the show I'm talking to two of Kia UK's executives. Uh, joining me, I've got Sales Director Steve Hicks uh, and After Sales Director Chris Lear. Good afternoon, James. Good afternoon, James. Good afternoon. So just a quick introduction for them both. Uh, Steve has been uh, with Kia for four years, previously working for Nissan, Hyundai and Ford before that. Uh, and Chris has been with the brand for 12 years before that, working at Peugeot. So uh, if anybody's got any questions today who are watching, if you're uh, watching live, submit them via YouTube. Um, you can submit them to us via that. They'll get fed through to me and I'll, I'll ask the chaps. Uh, but let's get cracking. Um, it's obviously been a very interesting uh, few weeks. Steve, I'll start with you. Um, how has Kia UK reacted to, to this crisis? Yeah, interesting is a good word, James. Um, you know, I've probably spent um, now five weeks at home in the home office. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, I don't miss some of my commutes um, and uh, video conferences is great. But in general, you know, I've just been so proud, you know, proud of the staff, the staff have reacted so positively um, in what is a pretty worrying time for all of us, and also the network. Um, taken some really difficult decisions quickly, promptly, and responsibly. Um, so again, um, I think you, know, you probably know, we've, we always pride our uh, relationship with our partners uh, right at the top of our priority list. And do you know what? We've stuck together through these difficult times. And I think, um, like I said, pride and um, just, um, just a sense of we will get through this together. I think that that's kind of got me through these five weeks as well. Kia has always uh, has been very popular and had some great feedback in our uh, car dealer power survey. So I know that you do look after your deal as well. We will come on to um, onto this help and support that you're giving them. But I just want to touch on head office for the moment and, and what it looks like at a manufacturer. Um, you've obviously had to make some massive changes. I take it nobody's in the office at all at the moment. You're all working from home. Yeah, correct. Um, like I said, probably just, I think on the 19th, um, we were starting to uh, practice to make sure that we could operate um, if a lockdown was to come, and it came pretty quickly after that. So yeah, um, you know what? Um, we all had Zoom probably installed last year, um, which has been a, a godsend for us as well. So yeah, um, our, I think as ever, communication is the key, um, both internally. So um, the senior management team meets on a, a daily basis, um, at 11 o'clock, just to go through an update. Um, plan what's going through. Um, Paul, who you know very well, um, always does a daily update to the staff, uh, making sure that they're kept informed of what's going on um, and just trying to reassure and keep um, motivation as high as possible because um, whilst you know, some of us, I quite enjoy working from home, it's a, it's, it's a good thing. For others who haven't done it before, it's a real challenge. So I think um, getting that motivation right, the communication lines open um, and Zoom's great for that. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of what we're doing. So um, we're kind of fully operational. Um, we've got about 80% of our staff um, still working. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we are trying to get as much what we manufacturers do well, planning, um, scenario planning, making sure our production and plans are in place and logistics. So, um, so that's, that's kind of what we can do quite well from a, from a home working office. Um, Chris, as this crisis built um, before the, uh, the, the the shutdown in the UK happened, what sort of information were you getting from other markets uh, that was fed into the executive team that, that, that helped make your decisions? Yeah, I mean, certainly on, on after sales, it was a slightly different scenario because lockdown hasn't been total closure, of course. Um, and we've had a proportion of dealers that have remained open, particularly for key worker support. So. What we saw in other countries was a similar scenario, and I guess Italy is probably the example I'm closest to, um, where they did continue for a period of time operating parts distribution, supporting dealers. That subsequently did change a little bit as their lockdown became a little more um, strict, shall we say. Um, so we were able to see the types of challenges that they were having. And um, one of them is, is like anything, it, it, with a medical crisis, is... Um, the number of staff that you can have around you. So things like parts distribution, um, it's all very well to have a warehouse, but when staff members start to self-isolate because other family members perhaps have symptoms, suddenly your capacity for logistics reduces quite severely. Um, and, and we did see that situation occur just ahead of lockdown, actually in the, uh, the week that Steve mentioned before from about the 17th onwards. Um, so, yeah, we were able to, you know, gain some learnings from that and understand how we would uh, modify our approach. 
I think you'd always like to say you had lots of contingency plans in place. I don't think anybody had dreamt quite the severity of this one up. So um, no. <laughs> um, some of the other comments you were making about what happens in head office, a lot of the support functions we give our dealers from after sales, our technical support teams, our warranty support teams, those are all sort of group systems that aren't necessarily all cloud-based. So it was a real test of our IT to make sure that not just one person could work from home, but frankly, the, the entire company could. And, uh, you know, great news, it's all worked. So uh, that's been good. That's been good. Congratulations on that front. Um, Steve, as you, um, as you saw this picture emerging across the world as a global company like Kia, um, you must have been getting uh, advanced information that, that this was going to happen here in the UK. Were you shocked when dealers were, were told to close on the 23rd of March? Um, I know, probably not. You're right. I mean, I think probably we were first affected um, as early as January when you know, most manufacturers get parts from China. So um, supply was um, was uh, had a hiccup, I suppose, at that point. Um, and as um, you hear and uh, through South Korea as well, of course, we're linked closely to uh, our headquarters there. The feedback there wasn't a surprise. But um, I think, you know, do you know what? Until that day happened, I'll, I'll probably never remember, never forget, sorry, um, Boris's announcement on that um, uh, afternoon. Um, and then suddenly from that day onwards, everything's changed. So, so yes, we could probably see it coming, but you always kind of hope that it wasn't going to happen, even though you knew it would. So, um, yeah, it's, um, and you know what? This is what I love the industry. I, I love meeting our network, going out, visiting dealers, seeing our sales teams, and I've missed that. Um, so Zoom can only do so much. So, yeah, it's, um, it's still a surprise even today now that um, you can't get out there and see your friends and colleagues. What advice did you issue to dealers at that time? Yeah, um, do you know what? Um, we kind of went kind of trying to keep it simple. So um, we, we wanted to make sure that communication was strong. So all of our websites, our social media, Google pages were up to date, making sure that customers knew who was open, who wasn't open. And again, and I'm, I know most of them, um, you know, spoken to, uh, to Robert, Dash and, uh, and Neil recently, and they've all you know, furloughed a lot of their team, but they've always kept core staff back to, to deal with inquiries, handle professionally, um, the customers we out there because you know, right now our staff and our customers are the most important priority and then other than that focus on renewals focus on customers who have got some um, cars come to the end of their um, contracts how we can help them and support them through um, and also you know mon managing the order banks so you know some customers will choose to cancel I mean we're in a good place where a lot of our eco cars um, have been, been in demand for a very long time we need to make sure that um customers who still want these cars will have them when the right time for them and once you don't we manage accordingly and I suppose above everything just manage the lockdown and and plan for recovery whenever that may well happen. What steps did you take to uh, help help dealers out I mean and I'm talking in terms of cutting costs etc. I think like everyone um, it's been really great to hear every single manufacturer has been praised by their networks that um, we reacted quickly I think we did the same you know we guaranteed margin where we could um, we paid bonuses as um, quicker than we would previously to make sure cash flow was within um, sites we've stopped any kind of um, adoption of vehicle costs um, uh, payments of demonstrators so anything we could to take cost out of, of our partners businesses um, that's what we look to do um, and again I think um, the network has responded well to that and 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 it needs to be so um because you know, without that network um we are nothing so um i think we've taken um good actions and most importantly quick actions so talk to me a little bit about um the, the current situation with your dealers are they managing to do business at all at the moment um and do you know of any that are actually delivering cars i mean it's something that we've covered quite extensively in the last 48 hours on cardio magazine website um there's a lot of confusion in the industry at the moment and, and amongst the networks whether it's right or wrong to do this. What are your thoughts as a manufacturer? Yeah, it's a, that's a really, um, it's a really interesting debate. Um, I read uh, with interest that, um, that comments. Um, we are, f all the way through this, we followed government advice. I think that's the best thing to do. Um, so right now, um, none of our dealers are handing over cars to their customers. Um, I think until we end the initial full lockdown, if we go to a partial soft, who knows what's going to happen, I'm sure we'll know more, then probably is the time when we should think about um, deliveries um, 
whether they are deliveries at home, deliveries in different formats. I mean, we are quite lucky as a network where we actually have quite large buildings with relatively small staff. So we have large areas that we can practice social distancing, um, improve our hygiene standards everywhere to make it safe. But ultimately, we need to understand what the customers want. It's, um, it's, it's pretty much irrelevant what we want. If customers want to take their cars and we can do it safely, um, post lockdown and the government supports that, we'll do that. Um, but right now, we're not planning to uh, hand over cars um, to customers. And I think, I think that's the right decision right now for us. And is that something that, you, that you've sent out as a manufacturer to dealers? We don't want you handing over cars at the moment. No, I mean, we, um, yeah, we don't really, we don't really set um, those kind of standards. I think, um, like I said earlier, I think all of our network have responded really, um, really positively in this, in this crisis. So they feel that same kind of um, uh, uh, confidence that we, we need to put our staff in safe positions. And we need to look after our customers. So um, no, our, our dealers have chosen not to do that. They are desperate um, to get working as we all are, and we will support that as quickly as possible. So um, you know, we'll look at uh, making sure our supply chains are, are in place because going from delivering 600 cars a day in March to where to delivering nothing um, is a challenge. It will take some time to build those supply chains up again. So that's what we can do to support the network. But um, I think we should wait a bit longer for handing over to customers. That's my view. But as soon as we can, we should go that way. Uh, the, the, the problem we've got at the moment is that we're, we're having a little bit of a, a false start, aren't we? There's, there's some dealers out there that are jumping the gun in lots of different, different areas. Some are reading into the guidelines that the NFDA have released uh, uh, what they need to, to uh, um, whereas others are, are saying there's a there's a moral issue here. Lockdown should mean should mean lockdown. Are you starting to hear from your your dealer network? Is there a bit of pressure building to um, to start business again? Yeah, there is. Um, like I said, I think uh, we our net our dealer network um, franchise board they meet once a week, so um, and they feed back to us. And yeah, they're very keen to do this, but do it in a responsible way. So, um, so yet yeah, there's a there's a desire out there, but um, again, I'd say probably most of their staff right now are furloughed. Um, certainly in the sales team, not so much in the after sales team. So I think um, until those staff members return back and we've got customer demand, what what I'm not seeing though is um, lots of customers saying, you know, please can we come and pick up our cars or deliver to us. So I think um, the two will collide at the right time. Um, in terms of customer demand and the ability to do safe handovers. Um, and I think that's when um, we'll be as ready as anyone to, to, to make those two happen. Because I think everyone now is thinking about how we come out of lockdown, but we shouldn't rush it. We don't want to dip back into another crisis. I think um, the government's doing a good job on that one and we need to support that. So, um, but I'm, I wouldn't criticize um, people who take a different view as well. If they can do it safely, and they're within government guidelines, fine, but that's not what our network are doing right now. Um, Chris, on the servicing side, that's obviously been something that has been, that been open, it was been allowed to be to continue for servicing key, key workers' cars. Um, what steps have, have you had to put in place or help dealers put in place when it comes to keeping that safe that, that could be transferred across to sales departments? Um, I think, as, as Steve mentioned, um, we do respect that each of our, our dealers are their own business and they will make their own judgment. So we've been trying to spread best practice, frankly, rather than perhaps some methodology that some other brands have taken or um, perhaps been a little more prescriptive in terms of policies, procedures and processes. Um, so clearly, you know, the social distancing side of things, keeping technicians a couple of days apart. Uh, the disinfecting of uh, customers' vehicles, the use of vehicle protection products, all of those things are kind of taken as read, really. Um, and I guess I have a view we need to go very careful um, that we don't advise or ill-advise dealers, I should say. You know, there are already regional governmental differences between uh, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, local restrictions. Um, so we just need to go very careful what we do and we don't say. And our basis has been where we hear really good best practice, let's share that with the network um, and just remind them of the basics. And um, we're pointing them very much to all of the industry and government websites that provide useful information. So that's that's been our approach up till now. I guess it's been a little easier in after sales in terms of employee distancing, if we can call it that, and social distancing with customers because... Um, the volumes are very much reduced. About two thirds of our dealers 
have been open in some way, shape or form, almost all of them on skeleton staff. So a much reduced workforce within the dealership, um, appointed, uh, appointed times for drop off of cars or collection and deliveries. Um, so all that has really sought to minimise risk. Um, Steve, on the sales side then, um, are you looking at what the after sales department are doing and, uh, and taking learnings from that? Um, and also, do you think we're going to get to a stage where, where PPE is going to be a must for, for people just working generally in a dealership? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think um, I think this whole doing this whole process, we we're constantly learning. And I think, as um, as Chris has said, after sales are still operational in a in a reduced format. So we are learning how those interactions with customers are taking place and what we can learn um, in the sales side. But right now on PPE, there's no real clear guidance um, on PPE in most workplaces. It's only really in terms of um, you know medical areas where that's required it may it may come in and again i think um there are there is some good guidance out there from the government and we'll look to share that um i think from the sales side it all comes down to you know, clear communication we know surprises we need to um we need to make sure that customers aren't anxious they um, they know where to go when they can come to showrooms um also in terms of use of technology i think um you know telephone email video conferencing these are probably more face you know i'm not sure i'd want to sit opposite another um, individual both of us wearing face marks and having a chat i think um, what we're doing right now is a solution that we may um, be looking to recommend rather than maybe these interactions um with ppe also i think it's really important that we go back to some of the basics you know making appointments scheduling these appointments so um everyone knows what to expect and doing it in the right way um, and then we can go on to maybe the next stage of home delivery um, and that is an interesting one uh, good question just come in from stephen connell on this uh, he says South Korea's response has been regarded as one of the best uh, to coronavirus. Have Kia now started retailing and selling vehicles there? And if so, how's it changed from pre-lockdown? And I know from a previous trip that I, I, when I've been with, with uh, Kia to Korea, they sell cars very differently there, don't they? Their, their salesmen have a meeting in the morning and then they go out to people's homes and sell them like... <laughs> Double, double glazing would have been done in the old days sat and sat on the sofas with customers is, is that something that's continuing um yeah it is i think um you're right south korea have done um, a great job of managing this and i think um that therefore the factories are still producing i'm sure we'll talk about that at some stage as well um and um in terms of um our global sales right now um the home market is um, it's not back up to full capacity, but it is recovering and it's recovered really fast. And you're right, um, they do do much more of a, a personal service, home deliveries, um, certainly in Seoul, and I know you've been there, it's um, you know, like many major cities, it's hard to have these big, huge um, facilities with uh, large dealerships there. So they're, they're much smaller and they do do the home deliveries already. So again, I think that's something when we get to that stage that we will, um, we will learn from um, both the after sales side and also our colleagues there and in Germany who also I think um, slightly ahead of this curve, they've lobbied hard to uh, make sure that dealerships can reopen. And I think that's something that we all learn from our German colleagues too. Yeah, certainly. That's something we covered on the um, on the website this morning is the is the lobbying that the German automotive industry did with the government there to make sure that they were open in the first wave of any restrictions being lifted, which has happened. Um, would you like to see the same thing happen here from the SMT and the OFDA? You know what, I'd be amazed if they're not doing that. I think um, yeah, Mike does a great job with, uh, with SMT and I think um, I think we 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 are an important um, part of the economy. I think also we need to be respectful as well. Um, the government's got quite a lot going on right now, so I think um, we will be lobbying in the right way, but um, I think the government will be as keen for um, dealerships to reopen when safe as we are um, to help the economy as well. So I think, um, I think yeah, we're lobbying all, all, in all the right places, and, but also we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll set, sit, sit in line, really, of when it's appropriate. Do you think the industry is going to need a stimulus when it does um, reopen? Um, you know, back in back in two thousand and nine, there was a scrappage scheme. Um, some people hated it; lots of people loved it. Um, you, know, you guys obviously did very well off the back of it. Would you like to be? Would you like to see something similar like that? I mean, perhaps not a scrappage scheme, but some form of stimulus from the government to help incentivize sales. Um, it's. Uh... Maybe not in the short term, maybe um, 
in the longer term, I think what we're looking to do in the short term is actually just satisfy the initial orders that we've got and look after our existing customers, as I said, with who are um, looking for renewals. I think um, conquest purchases and new customers to market, do you know what? It all depends on what the economy does. You know, if the economy crashes, um, I'm not sure there's a stimulus out there that will be sufficient. I think um, if we can keep the economy in a good shape, um, I think that along with um, what we're doing right now responsibly, um, marketing our cars and selling our cars, you know, I, I think that's that's probably the right thing. In the long term, yes, you know, if suddenly um, we we find that um, the middle ground is squeezed and customers can't afford to buy our cars, well then, you know, I'd, I'd like to see um, a continuation of what we're doing on our eco cars, you know, electric plug-ins and hybrids. Um, they're our most popular cars right now anyway. Um, if we can convert more customers who are thinking about petrol and diesel cars into eco cars, then then absolutely I'll support that. But um, you know what, I think the government are doing a, pretty, a lot of things right now to support um, families, workers. Maybe that's the right way to, to do the stimulus that way. We're clearly heading towards a very, very difficult time. And if, as if it isn't difficult enough as it is right now. But in the not too distant future, furlough schemes going to end. Redundancies are probably going to be very likely. The unemployment rate is going to go much higher. What do you think that's going to mean to, to car sales? Because there, there's clearly a bit of pent up demand here. But how does this kind of curve look like as, from, from your side? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think that's a concern, isn't it? I think um, right now we're planning for um, the most opportunist way. Um, into quarter three. Um, I think many of us have talked about how September, it, it's such an important month for us anyway. I think, um, you know, we're going to have to see where we are in terms of the economy. And, um, you know, ultimately, we want to be providing cars to our customers. Um, we need to make sure that they are affordable. So, um, but again, I think until we know more, I, I can't really, I can't really forecast. I mean, again, I think we're taking a, a positive approach until we hear confirmation that it's worse than that. I think that's probably the right thing to do right now. Um, Chris, on your side, um, Kia was very quick to come out with a policy on servicing. Um, and for those people that couldn't go out to a dealership because of lockdown, uh, you, you came out with a, with a statement that said they wouldn't be unfairly penalised. I take it that's gone down very well with customers. Um, do you think that's going to be something you're going to have to continue? Uh, yes, absolutely. You're, you're right. We, um, we came out with... Um, a real list of frequently asked questions because it was a real priority that um, a with not so many dealers being open customers could find out information very readily um, and the two key issues were, were as you've identified the warranty expiry my car's coming to the end of warranty it's going to expire well lot you should give customers every confidence that so warranty will be honored as long as it's a valid claim of course um so we, we've uh, we, we've done that that's been um fully supported by kia motors corporation in korea and um, they actually uh, put a formal statement out from our president uh, global president president song uh, in a personal letter to customers which does appear on our website um, giving absolute commitment to owners that their warranty would uh, be honoured. Now, that does have a, a timescale on it right now. Globally, that was uh, identified as cars running out of warranty between the 1st of February and the 30th of April. Um, inevitably, because lockdowns are extending in Europe, um, that will get extended. However, we always kind of knew when we took our lockdown decision in the UK, it was likely to go into May um, and, and certainly into the middle of May. Um, so we will be uh, we will be continuing to honour that, and that's identified on the website. Um, <coughs> sorry, to interrupt you. Uh, in terms of servicing, again, um, keeping the integrity of a warranty on a vehicle requires its scheduled servicing. Again, not all customers can get their car serviced, so we gave them um, uh, confidence that uh, the vehicle warranty would remain intact. And, and with regards to parts, have you, a, have you got a good supply of parts? And can you foresee any issues with that supply? We're in a really good place right now, actually. So um, leading up to the lockdown, um, we had lots of parts inbound to us, uh, both from Korea and from Slovakia. About 50% of our volume comes from each of those two locations, so it's half and half. Um, what um, we weren't able to do was put that product into the warehouse because, as I mentioned earlier, our staffing levels were reducing. The priority had to be to supply product out, not bin it. 
Um, so now we're in the fortunate position we can take all that product into stock. And that's what we're doing right at this moment in time. So we have good stock coverage uh, in our warehouse right now. And, and on the on the new car front, Steve, have you got enough new car supply to meet this demand? Um, I know that the the, um, the Korean factories are are producing again. I think Slovakia is 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 producing again. You've actually done pretty well when it comes to getting your factory started again. Does that put you in a in a good place when it comes to new car supply? Yeah, um, it does. You're right. We, we've had um, we had some mild shutdowns for a couple of weeks in both um, Korea um, earlier in the year, like I said, um, back in January and um, Slovakia shut again for two weeks. So they're both operational. Um, they are reducing production based on global demand. Um, so actually, um, the good thing there is you know, we, we've had customers waiting for over a year for some of our um, electrified vehicles. So they're still building those cars. So um, again, satisfying our back orders will put us in a good position. Um, stock wise, um, we can get as much as we need. So again, it's probably more the scenario planning of what um, we think the market's gonna be like um, through the rest of the year and into next year. Um, but um, certainly all of our colleagues in, um, manufacturing are there to support us. They're certainly not pushing um, product our way. They are waiting to make sure that um, it meets with our, um, our, our demand in the UK. So again, I think I mean, right now we've probably got about 12 to 15,000, I think, um, back orders, um, either to be delivered to dealers or in the production channel. So I think um, that's our focus on satisfying those ones. After that, we'll see what, what the market conditions are. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really positive about um, supply of Kia vehicles and I think we're in a good place to um, if there is a bounce we'll be um, able to satisfy customers with our cars. We had a very difficult March minus 44 percent in terms of in terms of overall new car registrations. April's clearly going to be in the high 90s um, negative. Um, what's your prediction for the for the rest of the year? Um, yeah I mean thankfully we got quite a lot of our March cars out before the, the shutdown came down. Again, we had a good, a good stock position. Um, so we were slightly less than the market on that one in terms of our reductions. Um, ah, do you know what, James? Um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty positive person. So um, again, if, if the lockdown is released in some form and we can start delivering cars, there's a lot of cars, and as long as customers still want these to go out in March, I think um, we can probably satisfy, as I said, with our, our sold back orders into June. So um, we, we could probably do quite a number of cars there if it's safe to do so. The challenge really is then when do we start taking new orders? And that's where July and August could be a challenge. Um, I think that's where we'll be looking to support our network, um, give them... Um, advanced warnings of the programs that we'll be planning to do in Q3 um, and also focusing on what the market will be in September. So um, I think July and August could be tricky. And um, again, by September, this will all be that back down to what you said, unemployment and the economy. If that's in a really bad place, then um, you know there's only so much we can do to try and um, take advantage of that. But um, you know what? The UK population are pretty um, robust a uh, bunch of people here so um we we love our cars we still want to be buying cars so i th and we've been through some challenges like this in the past so right now until i'm told otherwise i'm going to stay on the positive side that when we get out of this we can there's a business for us all there to go back to and um to start recovering some of the losses that we've all made over the last two months what about um new model launches for kia and kia's always had a very aggressive new model cycle um has that been affected in any way by by the by the coronavirus crisis? Yeah, it has. Um, you know, we literally had just got um, our sole EV um, launch cars to our network. Sadly, not one of them have been used um, because the lockdown happened. So, um, sole EV has been a bit delayed, but um, again, at the right time, that will come into uh, fruition. Um, but Sorento, um, our next car, and again, that's going to have um, eco engines as well. That will be delayed um, further into the year, um, which is a shame, but I think that's the right thing to do. I think we need to um, be focusing on new car supply later into the year. But again, get, it gets back to looking after our initial customers rather than pushing the new product out. But um, again, what we're seeing in terms of web stats and, uh, and traffic that we are getting it's the eco cars that our customers are most interested in. And certainly um, Soul EV and Sorento um, hybrid and plug-in hybrid 
are cars that customers I think will be looking for um, in the future. So again, at the right time, yeah, we'll, we'll delay one, but um, at the right time, we'll, we'll make sure those cars are fully available to our customers. What have you learned from your counterparts around Europe um, about um, what the end of the lockdown looks like? Have, you, have they got any lessons there that you can that you can implement here? I think um, I think on the sales side we're still a bit early. Like I said, probably Germany last week were just starting to come back. So I think um, uh, they're learning. I think what we what we have learned from the markets is take the time now to plan, and that's. Um, our, our dealers as well. Um, the guys that are still working, you know, this isn't going to be easy um, uh, going back to uh, some form of, of post lockdown, even in any form. Take the time now. It's not going to be, you know, even the supermarkets took a while to get um, their distance or distances in place and the perplex screens. I think um, all I can advise and we are doing right now is um, keep your staff motivated. It's going to be a tough time um, for them as well, but then start planning. And when, whenever this will happen, um, we're ready to do that. So I think um, that's probably the best advice for that we can give to our partners out in the dealer network. And um, I'm sure Chris is the same on the after sales side too. Yeah, Chris, on, on your side, have you, have you taken any, um, any learnings from, from counterparts in Europe? Yeah, again, as Steve said, it's quite early days, even in after sales as well, actually. But um, if you look at the German experience of the last few days, um, no one's come rushing in to get their car serviced in the same volumes as normality would dictate. Um, they're probably around about 50 percent or slightly below of the throughput. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a staggered start um, in terms of getting workshops up and running again. Um, Clearly, there's going to be some pent up demand because there are cars that have needed servicing or a warranty repair over the last sort of eight week period, I guess, by the time we get there. And those cars will start to come in. Uh, we're fortunate we have a, a system in, uh, in, in conjunction with um, Vital Software called Kia Contact, a system we have with all of our dealers. And we will be able to see what are now effectively recently lapsed customers. Um, and it will give us a real good steer on the kind of volumes dealers will expect to see. The other thing we've done to try and get things moving a little bit more quickly is to leverage our online booking uh, facility. So customers that were concerned about having their car serviced, part of our FAQ answer was to direct them towards online booking. And we've created quite a significant lead time in the system with the view that it's, it's a relatively safe lead time. If it isn't, um, it doesn't really matter. We as a manufacturer can communicate with those customers to say, for obvious reasons, your dealer will be in contact to reschedule you. But effectively, we're taking that lead, if you like, and, and getting it secured right now. And of course, um, in Kia, our Kia Care Service Plan program, not to three year old cars, around six out of 10 of them in the retail sector um, have a service plan. So those customers are going to come into the dealers, and it's just a question of us phasing those people in so i'm kind of not quite sure how it's going to pan out quite yet it's a real difficult one um is all that pent-up demand suddenly going to come at us will customers as i suspect is more likely the case be rather more reticent to go into what they would consider um, non-essential um, activity immediately um how geared up will the dealers be that i'm sure there'll be some staff absence still because of um, self-isolation so we just need to think when we press the right buttons at the right time. We have some other ideas um, to, to try and generate traffic in terms of vehicle sanitising solutions. I think that's probably uh, a valid uh, opportunity that we can, uh, we can pursue with some added value to customers and some uh, income stream for dealers. So that's something we're working heavily on at the moment as well. Um, Steve, what have the industry got to look forward to? Let's have some, have some positivity to end on. Well, do you know what? Um, what am I most looking forward to is that it's just some of the smaller things, you know, meeting family again. You know, I coach um, an under eight rugby team. I can't wait to see those guys again. I, do you know what? I, I look forward to um, the favourite day of my week is tomorrow at eight o'clock. Um, just seeing my street get outside to clap and seeing each other. So I, I'm looking forward to going back to sporting events, going to pubs, going to restaurants. And the same way, um, I think, I think um, we should look forward to, I think, we've changed a lot we, we're back to a, that, this community i think a lot of our dealer networks are really plugged into their own local community too they're helping out right now and i think i'm looking forward to uh, everyone coming back to supporting each other and i think 
the um, the dealerships will be um, a big part of that community and their support um, in a more positive time. So yeah, I am positive. I think um, the eco cars that we've got coming um, are there as well. So I think um, you know, I just hope we ha the economy doesn't get so ruined that the, all this isn't possible. But right now it isn't, and I think that's where I'm going to uh, keep my positive views on. What's this crisis taught you, Steve? Um, I, it's taught me that we are, as a network, um, agile, efficient and entrepreneurs. And I think we will come out with solutions that look after our customers in the right way. So I think we are, you know, we've got time right now to plan. And I think, um, you know, I, I've been so impressed. And um, I think a lot of manufacturers have talked about the amazing things that their dealers have done. And I, I, I'm the same. I feel so proud of that. And I think it's taught me that um, we should take this time now to look at how we change. You know, it's very difficult to, as an industry, to almost um, uh, change the electrics with the lights on. Well, the lights are off right now, so we've got opportunities to do things better. So I think um, we take that opportunity. We're not selling cars right now, but when we do again, let's make sure that we are better than we were when we closed. Chris, what about yourself? What's this crisis taught you? Um, I, I think it's taught me to um, maybe listen because there are lots of people that have got lots of really good ideas, whether um, that's in the manufacturer or in the dealer network. And um, whilst you always think you like to listen to people and give them responsibility, I think they've, they've stepped up to the plate and through the medium of Zoom and email, they've kind of, you know, they've really wanted to broker those ideas through. And I, I guess my real challenge has been how do I harness the power of that? How do I shepherd it? Um, occasionally there's quite a lot of overlap and quite a lot of noise around it. So you do have to be uh, quite careful that you don't become inefficient. But um, yeah, I think it's taught me that let's listen to people because there are a lot of people that have got some really good ideas out there and we can benefit from that and, and harness that in the right way. Super. Um, a massive thank you to you both for, um, for giving up your time. It's been absolutely brilliant today. Um, now, for anybody who hasn't yet downloaded the digital version of Cardio Magazine, you can download it on our website or on the Issue app. It's completely free of charge. Uh, you can find the, uh, all the details on the Cardio Magazine website. Um, rest of this week, I've got some, um, some brilliant guests lined up. Tomorrow, I'm talking to Perry's MD, Darren Arden. And then on Friday, it's Peter Vardy. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in the Cardio live like this one email me james at blackballmedia.co.uk you can find me on twitter at cardi the red or send me a message on linkedin um, and if you've got any questions for any of those guests uh, please get in touch i'll do my best to ask them there's a full schedule for cardi live on our website we can check back every weekday at midday cardi magazine.co.uk for our next live broadcast uh, which leaves me to say a massive thank you to chris and steve for joining me again today um, and i'll see you all tomorrow goodbye